Greetings, folks. It's Professor Fiore back once again. Today, we are going to talk about electric guitar physics. Why does an electric guitar or an electric bass look the way it looks? And by looks, I don't mean what color it is or the shape of the body. I'm talking about some more general kinds of things common to all guitars. Why, why is it that some strings are thicker than others? Why is it that the frets, as you get closer and closer and closer to the bridge down here, why do they keep getting smaller and smaller in space and they keep getting closer and closer together? And then pickups. Some, some guitars, some basses have two, three pickups. Some only have one. But, you know, this one has two, and there's actually multiple coils in here. So you can use a little switch over here to get different kinds of sounds. How does that happen? How does having different positions on here affect the sound? Well, ultimately, for the first part of this, in, a, in another video, we saw an equation, which is on the idea of tension in a string. How does this affect the vibratory mode of the, of the string? Well, the frequency of vibration, when you pluck it or strike it in some way, is equal to 1 over 2 times the string length, right, how long the string is, times the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length. And it comes down basically that mass per unit length is essentially sort of a uh, approximated, if you will, by the diameter of the string. We can think of just having a, a sort of a fudge factor, a constant in there to correct for it, but essentially that's what it is. Assuming the strings are all made out of the same material and they have the same kind of construction. Okay. So to, to prove this, I want to look at, you know, how would you calculate mass per unit length? Okay. Well, simply, you would just say, look, here's a string. Here's a chunk of string. Right, that I've cut. So this is the, you know, the cut face of the string. Okay. So the mass of this unit, this chunk of string, would simply equal its area, the area of this face, times the length of it. All right, that would give me the volume of this, of this material, of this, of this wire. And then we would multiply that by the density, which is you know, dependent on the material. Now, what do I make this string out of? Right. OK, so mu over here, mass per unit length. Squeeze that in. Um, when we look at that and I say, OK, well, this is what my mass is. It's area times length times the density. Well, you know, the unit length typically would be in metric would be a meter. I would do the same thing over here. So that would be in meters. And basically those meters cancel. The area, meanwhile, right, the area of, of, of this, the cut face of the string, okay, is going to be pi times the radius squared. And remember, radius is just half your diameter, right? The uh, diameter is equal to 2r, okay? So when you substitute this in, you say, okay, look, the area is you know, pi r squared, I have density, but that's consistent for all my strings. I'm not going to have my strings made out of vastly different materials. Um, so that just kind of, we can factor that out as a constant and just sort of forget about it for a moment. When you put that all together, you find out that the frequency is proportional to, not equal to, because I'm going to forget about the constants, but it's proportional to the square root of 1 
over the diameter, again, the diameter is just twice the radius squared, right? R squared, D squared, okay? So I can pull all those little things out like the density and, and this pi and so forth. So for a given length, right, some string length, some given density, some string construction material, this is what we wind up with. Well, hey, what's the square root of one over the square of something? Well, they basically cancel, right? Because, you know, one over d squared is the same as one over d times one over d. And the square root of that is just one over d. In other words, the diameter, the reciprocal of the diameter tells us what the frequency is. So as that changes, we see the frequency change in lockstep, right? This is assuming that I want to keep tension constant. So you might be thinking, well, all right, you know, that's for a certain tension, it's for a certain length. Um, I'm going to change the frequency, obviously. I don't want all of my strings to be the same pitch, the same note. You now we're going to come up with different kinds of tunings, but <clears throat> what's so great about having the tension constant? Now, I alluded to this in a preceding video, and if you haven't seen it, I'll just give you a real quick recap. There's really two things going on here. Number one is the playability of the, of the instrument. If I have vastly different tensions on those strings, they're going to feel different under my fingers. Some of them are going to feel tight. Some of them are going to feel kind of loose and sloppy. So to keep that consistent, I want the tensions to be the same. All right. Another thing is, if the tensions are wildly different, then the neck is under unbalanced forces. So, you know, if I get my base again, and I just, I just grab this little guy, okay? Um, if I made all of these strings the same diameter, the same gauge, okay? This is the highest string, right? So this is a five string, so this is B, A, excuse me, B, E, A, D, G. This, this string is, you know, well over an octave above this string. So to do that, looking back here to get to get the frequency to go up by a factor of two or three or something like that, you know, for the same length, because it's, you know, th this open scale length. And if they all were identical strings, that means mu is the same. Wow, the tension has to vary like crazy. So this way, to keep the tension constant, I go to these different size strings, right? These different diameter strings. Now, otherwise, you know, if they were all the same size, this string over here would have this tremendously high tension. This would be pretty high. You know, this would be very loose. Now think about that. This side of the neck is under very high tension. This side of the neck is under very little tension. Well, you know, that's obviously not good for the neck, right? You don't want your neck to be bending around like that and warping. You know, you want a nice constant tension on this thing so it doesn't do weird things like twist, okay? So multiple reasons. Okay, so when you go and buy uh, a guitar, you'll see that, you know, they come in gauge sets. They're like, you know, light and regular and heavy and so on and so forth. Now, that particular guitar, when it came uh, from the factory and the strings that are on it right now, the gauges, so this is basically uh, in, in mills, right? The gauges on that were 45 for the, the smallest string, right, the G string. And then it goes from there. Uh, let's see, we had 60, 80, and um, no, I take that back. This was a 65. My bad. 45, a 65, an 80, a 100, and a 130. Okay, so that's what the manufacturer, right? In this case, that would, that's an Ernie Ball music man. Um, that's what they put on there. Okay, well, you know, let's go check that out, right? So I get out my calculator and I say, hey, I want to find out, you know, is the tension really constant for these things, right? Does it really work? Well, the first thing I have to do is figure out, okay, um, I don't actually have to figure out the tension as it turns out. You'll see why in a sec. But I do have to know what the tuning is. 
right? Well, I'm using a standard tuning on this. So as the strings go up, right, like B, E, A, and if you're a musician, you know that's a perfect fourth. Well, a perfect fourth is approximately a factor of four thirds or 1.33333. All right. Um, some people would say it's exactly four thirds. That's not really true because we use uh, what's called an equal tempered scale. So it's just a slightly little tiny bit off. But for our purposes, you know, you could say it's just one and a third or four thirds. That'll be close enough. All right. OK, so all I really have to do is figure out, hey, what happens with this guy down here as I go to these new values, right? In other words, let me recompute the uh, frequency if I go from you know, a 45 to a 65. So I get out my calculator and I just plug in that change in the diameter. How much has that changed? And then I find out, okay, for this frequency change, you know, I, I get some value, okay? So in other words, I'm making it sound more difficult than it really is, right? Because this works out to just all you care about is f is proportional to 1 over d. That's all you really care about. So uh, when I go from uh, 45 to 65, I'm going from, let's call it unity pitch, to a pitch that's 1.333 times higher. Okay? So take 45 and just say, well, because it's proportional to 1 over d, I just have to multiply by 1.33333, and that'll tell me the gauge that I need. So I take 45, and I multiply by 1.333, and I get approximately 60, right? So I'm going to start with 45. So this is my calculated, 60. Then I'm going to take the 60, and I'm going to multiply that by 1.3333, and I get 80. Okay, again, because this is what the frequency would do if we had this sort of identical kind of material and, you know, all this stuff of the same length. This is what's happening to keep the tension constant. This is what's going to happen to that pitch, right? So, this, so the gauges are, are going um, larger and larger and larger because I'm going lower and lower in pitch, right? I'm getting to a fatter and fatter and fatter string, okay, going from down you know, up the face like this, okay? Anyway, I continue. So you take your 80, you multiply by 1.333, 33333, and I get approximately 106, 106.7 if I want to round it up. 106.6 and change. Okay? And now I'll take that one, and I'll do the same thing, 1.33333, and I get 142. All right, so these things are increasing, right? I mean, some of them are right on the money, right? We started with the 45 and the 80. The guy in the middle is just spot on. Um, you know, theoretically, we would have gone to 60, but they put a 65 on there. Theoretically, we would have gone to 106 and change, but they put 100. The biggest one is the 142 versus the 130 that they put on. So why might they do that? Well, first of all, uh, what they have put on here is a little less extreme as far as the diameter change. That makes the playability just a little bit easier, okay? Um, and by the time you get down to a 142, and that's, that's a pretty fat B string. So, you know, we're gonna trade off a little bit. The 130 is gonna be a little bit slack compared to, you know, the ideal 142, but I don't have this monstrous fat string either. So. You know, you give some, you get some. Besides, you know, these are on uh, standard sizes. You know, you can't, given, given uh, you know, manufacturing um, source materials and so forth, uh, it would be expensive to try and make some, you know, really weird size like 106.6. .6. So we just have standard gauge sizes and this works. And you can try this, right? You take your guitar at home, take, you know, like you get a, a you know, a set of, you know, regular strings or slinkies or, you know, whatever the heck they are, just do the same thing. And if you're using a standard tuning, 
you know, on a guitar, it's still going to be a perfect fourth, except for the two highest strings. You've got uh, you've got that that jump from the B, right? The the high B. Um, so that makes it off just a tiny little bit. But nonetheless, you can just start with your E string and go to your A string and your D string and your G string and just go this factor of one and a third. Just take take those values and work them, right? I mean, you would probably if you're going to work from the from the low E up. Right? You're starting over here, so you're going to be dividing instead of multiplying, but it's the same deal. And it should come out fairly close. Right? Like I said, it won't be perfect, but the idea is to keep that tension fairly consistent so the playability is consistent, and so you don't have these really huge unbalanced forces on the neck. All right? Okay, beautiful. The other thing I mentioned very quickly was the position of the frets. Okay? And that comes into this part of the equation right here. So what is one note to the next? In other words, how much of a shift? If a perfect fourth is like, you know, 1.333, you know, four thirds roughly, what is it from one note to the next? All right, we call that a semitone. And because we use this equal tempered scale, the jump from note to note to note, in other words, a semitone, <clears throat> is the 12th root of 2. It's a number that when you multiply it by itself 12 times, you get the number 2. That's an octave, right? A factor of 2 is an octave. And there's 12 notes. You know, there's, you've got the five uh, black keys. And if you look at a, key, uh, a, a piano keyboard, right? And then the, the uh, associated um, seven white keys. So you got 12 in between. That number is approximately... 1.05946 and some change, right? 1.06 roughly. Okay, that's what a that's what a semitone is, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the actual distance on the on the guitar, okay? And so that you can see it, I'm going to have to put a little booster thing over here so I can put the put the the bass guitar on. All right, you stay over there like that. Come here. So this guitar, this bass, is uh, a nominal 34-inch scale length. And I'm going to do this in centimeters because I don't want to deal with, you know, the idiocy of sixteenths of an inch and stupid stuff like that. So if you're wondering where I'm getting these numbers, that's where. So I'm going from the nut over here down to my bridge. Uh, get right about there. And I'm, gonna, I'm just doing this on the G string just because it's a little easier for me to see it. And that looks, it's a smidge under 86. Let's call it 86.4 centimeters. So that's my open G string. Now, if I go down one fret, I right, go down to the first fret, do the same measurement. It's a little off. We're looking at 80, get over there. We're looking at about 81 and a half, I'm going to call it, for the first. All right, so that's open. First, it's eight one and a half. I'm going to go down to the octave, the twelfth fret, which is right here. It's a smidge over forty three. I'm going to call that forty three point one. I am not obviously getting too super accurate here. You know, I'm going to be off by maybe a millimeter or two here and there. And then for the 13th fret, again, because I just want to compare, uh, we're looking at a little under, let's say 40, you call that 40.7 for the 13th fret. Alrighty. Take this guy away. Remove my little box. OK. 
Okay. So, what are we looking at now? All right. Well, need a pen. First thing I'm going to say is uh, open versus 12. That should be a factor of two. Okay. It should be a factor of two. Well, if I cut this in half, that's 43.2 centimeters instead of 43.1, but you know, I'm off by a millimeter. Oh, a millimeter. It's about the thickness of a dime, a U.S. dime. Okay. So I'm not being super, I wasn't being super, super accurate there. So there's the factor of two that we would have expected. Right. Now, clearly there's a bigger jump here. I mean, this is, this is about a five centimeter jump. And over here, you know, we're only looking at two and change for this. All right. So, you know, how do we do this? Well, I just take my value and I multiply it by my constant and I see what I get. Okay. So I am going to take the 81 and a half. I'm going to multiply it by one point. Zero five nine four six, and I get eighty six point three and change. Okay, so this guy gives me eighty six point three. If I round it off, three five. All right, so mm, there you go. Again, within my little measurement error, and then I am going to take where is it? Uh, my forty point seven. Right, so this is my 13th fret. It has to have that same ratio. And this equation is telling us, yeah, that's inversely proportional to the length. There's no square root. There's no square. There's nothing weird. It's just a simple inverse proportion. So I take my 40.7 and I multiply that by 1.05946. And I get 43.1. Bingo. Perfect. 43.1. It's actually 43.12. All right. But, you know, now you're talking tenths of a millimeter. So, hey, that's looking pretty good. OK, that's looking pretty good. All right. So we can see that it's all about these ratios. The ratio between any fret, right, and the next fret is going to be the semitone because that's what it is. It's a note. It's a semitone. And that is this value of the 12th root of 2 or of roughly 1.06, right? Bingo. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about is the why do you have multiple pickups? Some pe people think this is only because you can get a higher output, but that's not exactly true. It does change the sound and it has to do with the way in which this vibrates. OK, so if you looked at the video on tension string, Right? So I got the string, I pluck the string, and it vibrates. But it vibrates in multiple modes. So the simplest mode is like this, just back and forth. Right, The whole string goes burp, 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 burp. But there's also the second harmonic. All right? Cut this in the middle. And the second harmonic, and I'm going to make this really big, just so that you can see it. It's going to look something like this, and then it flips. These are supposed to be sine waves. They're not great looking sine waves. So it basically kind of goes like this, and then it goes like this, back and forth like this, right? So that's the second harmonic. And the third harmonic is also playing in this, okay? So that's going to do something like this. So again, as the two end ones are up, the middle one is down, and then the two end ones go down and the middle one goes up, right? This whole thing is like vibrating like this. And there's a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh, and it just keeps on going. And all of these things are happening at the same time. That's why if you get out an oscilloscope and you look at the output from a, from a uh, pickup, you don't just see a nice sine wave. You see kind of a funky looking waveform. Okay? All of these things are in there together. Well, as you can see, in some places there are dead spots. Remember, when we were talking about pickup design, Faraday's Law, we need to have lines of force moving relative to the conductor, the coil. Well, there are dead spots here. Like for the, for the red, for the third harmonic, there's a dead spot there and there. For the second harmonic, the blue, there's a dead spot here. Well, if I stick a, a, a pickup here and I stick a pickup here, they're actually picking up different things because of the vibratory modes. If you stick your pickup way back toward the bridge, 
you kind of get everybody that you don't have a, a dead spot but you don't have really big amplitudes either especially for the the lower note like the 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 octave and the, and the second harmonic so it kind of sounds a little thin when you do that you move it up further the saddle you know you get some larger amplitudes and they'll sound thicker and heavier okay and then you can combine these and you can get even you know more variations in terms of the sound of your guitar so there you have it right we understand why there are different gauge sizes we understand uh the the, the whole idea on, the, on the, the fret thing right why do the frets keep getting closer and closer and closer and now why are there multiple pickups in different locations it's physics man like i said it's better than magic because it's real See you next time.